Hello, everyone. Welcome, friends here, friends there. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this two-day TV event that we are calling The Long Match. It's a conversation. It is an encounter. Uh, my name is Matthew Glassman. My pronouns are he and him. Um, I'm currently an ensemble member with Double Edge Theater, and I'm proud to be welcoming you on behalf of Double Edge and HowlRound. Theater Commons, um, and its director, Jamie Galoon, who couldn't be here today, but who co-curated the series um, on the intersection of art, culture, and commenting, um, and beyond commenting, <laughs> important, uh, which aims to underscore the unique role that artists and cultural workers play in reimagining and reshaping our future. Uh, this is day two. In case you missed day one, uh, it was yesterday. It was great. It was an online conversation um, that was put together by art.coop, uh, Caroline Woolard and um, Marina Lopez. Uh, had some incredible artists and practitioners there. It's living in the archive. I highly encourage checking it out if you missed it. Um, and this, today's conversation will also live on, so please feel free to pass it on. Um, one other piece of uh, technicalities is not you, because you're here. <laughs> we can interrupt each other and talk as we want to. But for those of you that are out there, there is a chat window. And we invite you to put your name in the chat, uh, bring your questions, your comments, your thoughts, um, also the land that you are a guest on, um, anything else. Please, we invite you to be as active as you want to. And as much as we can, we will get your questions and interject interjections and freeform associations into the conversation. Great. Um, let's see here. I need to begin um, by saying where I'm speaking to you from. <laughs> I'm speaking to you from a place, a town that is now we now call Ashfield, Massachusetts, which is the homeland of uh, the Nipmuc tribal people. Um, the Nipmuc, which means people of the fresh water. Um, I want to honor and respect the Nipmuc uh, tribal sovereignty, its elders, its ancestors, uh, its lifeways, its experiences, um, who continue to live on this land. I want to honor their sovereignty, uh, their traditions, and I want to express gratitude for all of the culture that is being shared, despite all that was stolen and harm that continues to be done. Um, I want to honor uh, the other present-day indigenous tribes, and I want to say that um, there's acknowledgement and there's action. Thank you, Rhonda, leading me towards this. Um, I really appreciate it. So action can look like many different things. Uh, it can look like um, at the local level, at the state level, at the national level, finding out which uh, bills are being passed, uh, which initiatives and movements are afoot, um, finding out ways that we can recognize and make changes to the dominant narrative that glorify colonization, like we have here with the name of the Pioneer Valley, and find ways to support movements afoot to change those names. Um, support as well, um, uses of uh, uh, the bills and movements afoot that uh, find alternatives to um, terrible imagery found in mascots, um, and generally being a part of action that uplifts the respect for cultural heritage. And also find out about uh, the Land Back uh, campaign, um, landback.org. Um, is a great place to go. Uh, and as you are writing in the chat, please feel free to acknowledge this land that you uh, are a guest on and the, the people um, that need to be honored as a result of that. Um, we are drinking here in Asheville the water from aquifers that come from glaciers uh, from long ago. <laughs> and I'd like to just uh, call on Joy Harjo, who writes that glaciers swim backward in time. Uh, I say this because um, I want to continually bring us back to intergenerationality and this continuum of time today. Um, I want to acknowledge today is March 18th. <laughs> it is 2.00 something p.m. It's Friday. It's a full moon, the worm moon. It is uh, during the decline of the Anthropocene and amidst ongoing historic and racial economic injustice, um, this context is needs to continue to hold primacy for us 
even as we delve into that which is possible and that which gives us hope and that which we are uh, embarking on together. Um, and as we watch from and feel from afar, uh, war is ravaging uh, in many places. Um, in the Ukraine, where my great-grandparents escaped from about 100 years ago. Um, again, grounding us in this place of intergenerationality. Uh, my great-grandmother, Becky Hunt, who, 14, found a way to uh, hide and escape and make a long journey. Um, again, this is more than acknowledging, but to know and to feel this cordedness of time. This is a slipstream of time that we're on and inviting this into this conversation, that there is a past, there is a present, and there is a future. This notion of the long match, <clears throat> the long match refers to ways of carrying fire over long distances, practiced by many indigenous people, many different ways. Uh, embers carried in loam, in moss, in bark, um, other materials. Having live embers, obviously meaningful to be able to start a fire after a long migration, but most important is the cultural and spiritual continuity that comes with those embers. This, uh, the fire that we bring with us, the stories that we told by those fires, the people we sat with, the knowledge that we, we gained, from lived experiences, the healing that happened, and the laughter, and the, the animating spirit of something inside a mystery that we kept and we got by those fires we take with us through long, dark journeys. So this question of the long match is an animating metaphor um, to think, yes, this is a series about art and culture and commoning, <laughs> but it's more than that. It is to say, what are the embers that we carry with us? This is an invitation to widen the circle beyond that I stand in the circle of art and culture and commoning. Um, and it's to say, who knows what change we'll live to see? So we're holding these embers, and we're traveling with them, and we're sharing them with each other. This conversation, which has uh, you will see when the camera pans, an incredible array of visionaries, uh, doers, dreamers, thinkers um, from many different disciplines. Uh, it's in the spirit of acknowledgement. I promise I'll be done very soon. <laughs> but I need to acknowledge my teachers who are also in the room with Stacy Klein and Carlos Uriona, who's uh, whose teachings and hard-fought um, successes uh, and exper lived experiences are, are gifts that I bring into this room and it's part of the reason why this is happening. Um, again, thinking about this continuum that we're on. This impulse for this conversation with this group of people from uh, theater and not theater, from uh, solidarity economy and research and activism to the commoning to indigenous cultural center and, and beyond and all of you is inspired by this question of um, the role of the artist in forging this future. Um, often unseen, often unrewarded and unacknowledged. Um, six years ago I was Lucky to meet David Bollier, whose life has been dedicated to this movement of commoning, um, thanks to Vijay Matthew of HowlRound. Um, and this conversation about be, that we had began to inform us that, oh, Double Edge is a part of this. We are commoning. We didn't realize this. We started to think about that this is an economic framework, but as time goes on, of course, this is not purely economic, and it's not just political. It's cultural. Culture is upstream. And even within culture are ways of knowing. So today is an invitation to think about the poetics and the practicalities and the ways of knowing that inform our work. Um, there's not enough time for, to go as deep and far as we'd like to today with all these people. 
Um, I want to mention our dear friend and fellow panelists today, Jonathan McCrory of National Black Theater is on his way and is running late. You'll see him arrive shortly. Um, but I just want to thank everyone for being here. Um, in the spirit of coming together uh, and these embers of the long match, uh, I want to invite you all now into the conversation. Um, I'd love for you to briefly introduce yourselves, um, your work, perhaps something you bring with you from past generations, uh, what you're carrying with you. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. I can assign someone, but is anyone feeling moved to speak? Larry? I think, it's, I think I'll go make sense. Um, Nina Hokan Kanto Cho Kesicek. My name is Larry Spotted Crow Man. I am a citizen of the Nipmuc tribe of Massachusetts. I am speaking to you from my traditional homeland, the same land that my ancestors have been on since um, the beginning of all things. Um, thank you, Matthew, and everybody who had a, a part in uh, setting this up. It's always um, an honor to be able to speak on my homelands and, uh, and share um, because I think that's the time. Um, my words are truly the vessel of what this land is uh, speaking and sharing. And so with that, the, the most important thing I can open up and share is, uh, before I get into some of the work I've done, is uh, the words that were, the first words spoken on this land, um, the first language by the two-legged that were heard, which we call the ecology of the land. And as we say in our language, I greet you in those words, and I mentioned our grandfathers and grandmothers and, and all our relations to come and share in a very good way, in a reciprocal way, that we would, um, and it sounds funny in English, share our breath, but we know our breath is what we breathe, and if we can't breathe, we don't have a life, so our breath is our spirit, so it means our spirit. And, um, and this is why our words are, are very important, the things that we say, because our words are our breath, and our breath is our life force. <clears throat> and so we ask that we share that life force in a good and positive way. Um, and so in English, again, I'm Larry Spotted Crow Man, citizen of the Nipmuc tribe. I'm a writer, poet, founder, and uh, co-director of the Oki Tail Cultural Center. Um, I've been doing this work for three decades now or more. Um, had the wonderful opportunity to travel around the world and share my uh, culture and traditions uh, with the multitude of people and, and experiences. Um, I'm also currently the artist in residence at Bunker Hill Community College and um, presently working on a children's book and uh, briefly segue into uh, indigenous people in writing. Um, uh, what my latest book, Drumming and Dreaming, can be, it's, it's appropriate for all ages. However, it's not necessarily a, um, a children's book. I'm, uh, I got the opportunity to work on this wonderful project with the University of uh, Iowa and the indigenous uh, um, group out there uh, to create this children's book series. I'm really excited about that. And uh, as I dove into this, and I'm really happy I'm doing this because as we looked into the research as of um, 2015, uh, there was about 0.8% on the market of indigenous children's books, about 2% Latinx, and African American probably about 5%, and then 12% animals and trucks come in. And then the 70 or so percent is all white. So I was really thrilled to do this and kind of shift that uh, when we're speaking in terms of commenting and reciprocity. and. Um, and uh, I'll, I'm sure I'm going to have a lot more to say, but I just wanted to add real quick that in our language, there's no word for art. There's no word for conservation. And there's no word for commenting because these are all natural things that were done since the beginning of time for our people to share. Uh, there was no, what I'm going to do, it's what are we going to do? Um, and in the sense that our society has inculcated this idea of me instead of we. And, and you know, we, we're all out there trying to find our destiny and not about what we can do for our community and our people. And so um, it is important that we go back to this. And uh, 
And lastly, I want to say, uh, it really stuck out something you said, Matthew, is um, what changes we would live to see in our lifetime. And right now, I'm living that. I grew up in the 80s. There was still segregation. We were still abused by our teachers as indigenous people. Um, I come from three generations of boarding school survivors. Um, and right now, I'm seeing changes where we're running the first uh, operated and owned indigenous cultural center ever. I'm seeing reciprocity with allies. I'm seeing land back. Our tribe in Massachusetts alone had 2,000 square miles. By the late 1900s, we're down to five acres. Today, we're up to a hundred, couple hundred acres and growing. And so it, these are fundamental changes that I thought I would never see in my lifetime. So it's really thrilling to live to see that, you know, and be a part of this and see the young folks and, and, and have this center to inspire and uplift them. And as a writer, never having to, and because I was an artist, I had the platform to, to push my books. Like, hey, you can sing and dance, so maybe you can write. So they would, they would check out my books. But uh, we know that indigenous writing, as I mentioned with children's books, are always a niche genre. And so, um, to have the center, to have this opportunity to lift up indigenous artists from all over the world and give them that platform that they so rightly deserve and have been uh, uh, missing for so long is, is very important to, to what I get to do and it's really fun. So thank you. Pardon. <laughs> um, this term commoning obviously is, will be coming and going. I feel like I'd like to ask uh, David Bollier, if you wouldn't mind going next and introducing yourself and your work so that we can sure. connect to that. Well, I'm David Bollier, and I've been, um, I fell into the commons after a long stint in Washington in the policy and activist world there and became a refugee from it uh, because I knew it just didn't have the promise that we needed. And, you know, I want to thank Double Edge Theater for hosting this conversation because I think it's so important to have this cross-sectoral conversation to find out we're all refugees from capitalist modernity, or at least we aspire to. Uh, and uh, for me, the Commons has been a vessel or vehicle for trying to make another world. And I realized that the past that I'm bringing with me is both a, a, a legacy and scaffolding for what I'm doing now, and it's also some heavy baggage that I need to uh, drop. And I think that's a lot of us have that challenge of taking the embers from the past and making some new fires. Uh, so I really like the framing of this conversation. And for me, the Commons opens up doors because it talks about reciprocity and relationality as opposed to individual market transactions, which is the definition of our culture, more or less. So to the extent that we can develop these new frames for developing different types of relationships, we start to grow a different kind of culture. And one lesson I learned from my days in Washington was that discourse trumps everything, even policy and law. And so in some ways, the challenge on us is to develop a different discourse. And I think the Commons helps us understand it's not just the commons, the noun, which is co-optable and corruptible, it's commoning the practice, which you either do it or you don't. Uh, and so to the extent that we can open up some new types of commoning here, uh, I will find that really helpful personally. And I think the embers of the old fire will illuminate some new pathways forward in new fires that we might start. So I just will leave it at that because I think we'll have some more time for conversation later on. Can I just ask one quick follow-up to you, which is, can you say something about, you've been interacting with Double Edge and other arts organizations, can you say something about how you see this relationship between art, arts and culture and, and, and Well, culinary? I think it's precisely that arts and culture are not cognitive, rational, logical, dominant narrative. They're about getting to some of the deeper levels from the collective unconscious to the stirrings and yearnings that we don't even know how to name and can't be poured into words. So to the extent that artists can express this, it makes it real, it makes it something we can talk about and relate to. And so I think that that's partly, <laughs> art and culture is maybe our, uh, an essential path for our escape to a new place. Uh, so I see that in so many different artists, which is why, you know, I'm a writer, I live by words, but I also am keenly aware of their limits. 
And so I think that's why I put a lot of stake in art and culture. Thank you. Stacy and Carlos, do you feel, how do you feel about going next? Okay. Great, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. No pressure. <laughs> um, I'm Stacy Klein. I'm the founder of Double Edge Theater, and that was in 1982. So we are um, about to celebrate our 40th anniversary season. Um, I think there's a lot of seasons and traditions that um, have framed Double Edge. Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan Kane. One moment, please. Hi. I finally made it. Yeah. It's a long trip from New York here. Yes. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. I was in the middle of my introduction of myself. Um, so you're sharing with me already. Um, I, I think that Double Edge is, includes many traditions and um, backgrounds, but um, I just talk somewhat about the ones that have shaped me. Um, my teacher, Rena Moretzka, I want to say her name. She is um, 88 years old. She is um, nearing the end of this time period of reality. Um, and she taught, has taught me for over 45 years. Um, one of the things that I brought into the founding of Double Edge was her um, idea of ownership as n something that is internal, um, spiritual, and emotional. Um, and that has nothing to do with buying and selling things or even interpreting things, but it has to do um, with our relationship with our partners. Um, so that um, also relates to the Jewish tradition, which I'm part of, um, also from the Ukraine and Poland for a couple thousand years, um, and um, that tradition is about dialogue, um, and that tradition is also about self-leadership and sharing leadership with a community um, and different aspects of the community. So that really is, um, a key in, in the formulation of Double Edge as a um, partnership organization and collaborative organization. Um, leading me to a project that we did with Double Edge um, right after the Soviet Union fell um, in the early 1990s in, uh, outside of Lvov in the Ukraine, um, which was about the, both the ruins of the Jewish people from the Holocaust um, and from the Soviet Union, and also about the youth there and how they could re-identify themselves as a people. Um, so um, I'm sad to see that that is uh, today, they continue that um, fight, and I just want to acknowledge that they're with me in the room here today. Um, and also, finally, I'd like to, I'm really moved by the partnerships that Double Edge has in the room here, um, particularly Okiteo Cultural Center, um, and also um, the Theater Offensive, and um, also the National Black Theater. Um, 
who we're partnering with with another partner, the Jupiter Performance Studio. So I think today, in the last several years, Double Edge has had the opportunity not only to root ourselves in our artistic work, but also the partnerships which we feel um, represent uh, the world um, and um, represent how the world should be represented. You want to jump in? Mm, sure. With, with doubts, like in the swimming pool. Um, <laughs> I'm Carlos Uriona, um, originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I arrived to Double H Theater in 1996. Yeah. Over the time, I became one of the co artistic directors. I grew up in the land of the Mapuche, no, sorry, the Pampas. And uh, the Mapuches are there, but that's not the land. Uh, and um, and there are Ankeles. Uh, I started theater during, um, so I was 20 years old when the, the, the military coup d'etat happened that took about 10 years of our lives, eight years. Um, so I started making theater in that, those conditions, and that is something that I always carry with me. Uh, that's, that, that's sort of uh, doing things, thinking about the adversity. Um, the, the other thing that I, I learned is that for some reason, fate or whatever it was, somebody brought me <clears throat> into researching gaucho theater and native theater in the early days, something that I didn't know but today. I was talking to Olga about that and, and David, um, which was an engine of the culture that now everybody talks about Buenos Aires. The engine came from the rural areas and from, from people that were not European. Uh, I am a, a European descendant, but uh, from, I would say from marginalized uh, groups in Europe that ended up migrating to South America. Uh, I think we all confront somehow the, the same, uh, but we need to really be aware because it's very difficult for us to understand what Larry was saying earlier. Uh, as we are victims of colonization, we also have victimized others. So that's something that I grew up with and, and is still. Uh, the things that brought me to commons that to me I learned with six years ago when I started listening to David the, this way of framing because my, my previous history was more about communism not about commons and it was more about anarchism and other forms of political uh, work that then imbued my work with, as an artist the, the things that brought me to commoning was uh, the during those years of war um, the thing that I, I believe helped us, the ones that we survived together, was this kind of small group active defending ourselves. So after that, we became a cooperative and different stages. Um, so that's the cocktail I carry with me. Uh, I like to drink it probably every, every day. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you said I'm glad you said a couple of things. When I was acknowledging you both, I was talking about successes, but really what I was wanting to acknowledge was that you were, both of you in the last 40 plus years of work have actually been fighting against tremendous odds. So that's more important to me than whatever, whatever else that this is the result of. And that's what was important for me to acknowledge and thank you for reframing. I also want to say thank you for inviting in um, the you know, the Spanish anarchists who we've talked about and these sort of different modes of thinking and uh, ways of knowing because there are so many conversations afoot right now. Um, I've sat in the Art Doc Co-op uh, learning sessions and delving into the solidarity economy and I think about the circle around the solidarity economy and I think about the Spanish anarchists and what's so misinterpreted about that and how incredibly 
practical and spiritual that movement was. And I think about the ways of knowing in indigenous culture. And so that's, thank you for bringing that in because that's what we want to be having together without saying the name is who I am and what I do. <laughs> but the verb that I choose is, is most important. So I would like to ask you, Francisco, do you mind going next and, and introducing yourself and your work and anything intergenerational you want to bring in? Of course. Um, you know, first of all, thank you to HowlRound and Double Edge for hosting this conversation. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, already learned a lot from you. Looking forward to learning more. Uh, my name is Francisco Perez. I am a Dominican New Yorker. I grew up in a limited equity housing cooperative, so that was my first lesson in the value of solidarity economy uh, and commoning. So we own our building, uh, which means we get to live uh, in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, you know, in, in, a, in an apartment that we own, right, and is permanently affordable, although again, not able to sell it at market rate, right? So that showed me the trade-off. You can give up uh, the ability to earn a handsome profit in return for the right to shelter, right? Uh, I'm now a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, um, and I'm the director of the Center for Popular Economics. We do workshops and trainings uh, with social uh, economic and, and racial justice activists, um, and have also started working with artists. Um, so we do workshops and trainings to help people understand the economy. Uh, my partner, Natalia Linares, who is taking care of our two small children, uh, which allows me to participate here today, uh, is involved in art.coop, uh, which many of you um, should have learned about yesterday, but if you haven't, uh, please uh, check out the archive uh, and listen to that conversation. But you know, she and I have been talking about um, how to have these conversations with artists, right? We both strongly believe, and I'm sure everyone on this panel would agree, that the, our current creative economy is broken. It is failing artists. It is failing our culture. Um, so artists absolutely need a solidarity economy, um, but also the solidarity economy needs artists. Uh, as David was saying earlier, um, you know, we need to imagine a whole new way of being, uh, a new way of, of, of living and relating to one another, and we cannot do that without the, the creative powers um, that artists um, are gifted with. Um, so, you know, we've um, tried to have, you know, do workshops and trainings with artists around the economy. And one of the figures um, that I've been thinking about uh, a lot recently, and, and you know, uh, look forward to talking to the people on the panel here with today, is, you know, we ask about intergenerational um, knowledge and struggle is uh, the the great Peruvian uh, Jose Carlos Mariategui, uh, who combined arts, culture, activism, and indigenismo, indigeneity, right? So he was the founder of the Peruvian Socialist Party, founder of the uh, uh, a Socialist Workers Federation, but also the, a writer uh, and a journalist who edited a cultural magazine that included you know, poems and essays by world-renowned artists like uh, Miguel Enamuno, um, Borges, uh, and then also, you know, uh, labor notes from organizers around the Andes. Uh, and he was, you know, very famous for including indigenous art and indigenous people and for always, um, for arguing being one of the foremost advocates of the idea that we could build a future society based on uh, the communal traditions of the Quechua and the Aymara in, in, in the Andean region, right? So I feel like if we're looking for um, revolutionary ancestors, people who've carried that, that long match, um, you know, we should, we can learn a lot by, by invoking uh, his example and, and, and ideas. So, you know. Can you say his name again, please? Jose Carlos Mariategui. Thank you. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about. I'm going to take the advantage of Matthew asking me to interrupt earlier. Yeah. So it's not that we're talking about somebody in the past, because Bolivia, which is the first ever, I think, plurinational state, which is, a, a, is, a, is something that we haven't experienced until probably 30 years ago, is ruled by this party that has its origins in Mariategui's ideas, but also the movement of, um, in the Andes of the Aymara people uh, in Peru is still today present, we're going to have a couple of visitors in the next uh, month here in Ashfield um, from Yuzhkani's group, which is a theater group that is related to that. So we're not talking about the past. We're, we're talking about there is a presence today of all this. And that I think is important to, because, you know, the, the tendency in the discourse is to 
<laughs> talk about what happened, mm -hmm. and then we get stuck in what happened, but no, it's happening now. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I mean, um, unfortunately, Mariate is not very well known in, in North America, but is, you know, his, that tradition lives on um, in very powerful ways in, in Central and South America still. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're still carrying that long match, and, and we would, could learn a lot by, by picking up on uh, many of the same uh, concepts and ideas. Wonderful. Thank you, Francisco. <clears throat> uh, Abigail, would you go next? Sure, Thank sure. Um, Abigail Vega, she, her. I am the current creative producer at HowlRound Theater Commons, so very honored to be here today, um, which is based in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I, if you're watching this and you're like, wow, those people are amazing. That's what I'm feeling right now. Like I'm feeling <laughs> like I I'm, have serious imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> so I uh, came into commoning through the Latinx Theater Commons. I started uh, with the LTC when I was 24 before. Form my brain was fully developed, so I, I it, it kind of hardened and developed in the, in the doing of the commons. And like you said, Matthew, yeah, dreamers and doers. I don't know that I'm a dreamer, but I, I do know that I'm a doer. So, um, <laughs> so that's where I come into this space. Um, I'm, I'm sitting next to Olga Sanchez Saltvite, and what's so um, beautiful is that we just did the math. We haven't seen each other since July 2019. Yeah, terrible. So that's this is too much. <laughs> It's a good moment. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm coming to the space from. And I think something I'm bringing is that when, uh, you know, the LTC, I'll just speak to that, the LTC um, is, a, is a piece of a movement that Olga has a lot more information on and will speak to, uh, that is many, 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 many decades old. And when I started working with the LTC, one of the most generous things that happened was that a lot of the, we'll say elders of the movement, um, uh, shared their mistakes with me in an effort to not make them again, which was so radical. They were so willing to talk about successes and challenges and, and obstacles, but they were also um, willing to share the things that, that, the mistakes that we make by just being human and trying to be human with each other. And, and I always try to bring those with me and share those when I'm in spaces, especially with uh, people who I'm offering, I don't know, mentorship, whatever, um, because that is so radical to be, to be so um, at the forefront with that. And I think that's what I'm bringing into the space today. Great. I don't know that I have anything else. Well, I'm going to ask you one quick question yes. to follow up, and thank yes. you for that so far. Can you say something uh, about HowlRound? Sure, yeah, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, I think I like this order uh -huh. that you're proposing. I think it's the right, it's not right or wrong, it's the order that feels meaningful because um, I'm glad we're starting with you, and I, this connection to this how around as an organization, as an institution, as an infrastructure, as a set of tools and resources, mm -hmm. as a cultural movement. You can say something about it and how it fits into what you said before. Sure, sure. So um, HowlRound, like I said, uh, based in Boston, HowlRound Theater Commons is a knowledge commons for the global theater community. We have a number of tools, including a, a, a TV platform, which you're watching this on right now, a journal, uh, a podcast platform, uh, we do convenings, we host, uh, we're the, the home of the National Playwright Residency Program, um, which is funded by the Mellon Foundation. But beyond that, we um, are a place for people can bring their ideas um, and contribute them to this knowledge commons, right? So there's no paywall for HowlRound, everything is accessible for free. Um, we pay people to um, write and uh, be on HowlRound in various <laughs> capacities. and. Um, one of the, the core values of HowlRound is generosity and abundance, right? This idea that um, maybe we don't have to all live in a silo. Maybe it's not about competition always. Maybe uh, there's a version of things where everybody can get ahead. Um, and there's been a lot of, it, when we speak about the, you know, even just the American theater for a moment, we are a global platform. We have um, readership and viewership and participation from all over the world. Uh, but if we speak just for the, what's known as the United States right now, there's been a lot of changes in our field in the last 
decade or decade and a half, um, not all of which can be traced back to Hanuman, but can be traced back to this um, kind of awakening that we're going through, maybe reawakening, our elders might say, yeah, okay, we've seen this before. <laughs> um, but this idea that um, we're not gonna put up with that, I don't know what it is, what we're not gonna put up with stuff anymore. Or we're, we're gonna ask for transparency. No, 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 we're gonna demand transparency. We're gonna mm -hmm. expect it. We're going to expect um, people be uh, treated uh, like humans, that they be paid equitably, that they, um, that, uh, that things have to shift. And so, so I like to think that HowlRound is part of that conversation, is it a part of that opening, that people have a place to go to say, to platform radical ideas. Yeah, I think that's Thank what you. I have to say. That's great. Um, I'm gonna keep moving down the line, Olga, especially because you are just referenced, and would you mind going next? I do not mind. I'm wondering, um, Rhonda, if you would like to go as one of our hosts? Okay, I'll go. Uh, hi, everybody. Olga Sanchez, Salt Vite, she or hers. And um, I'm currently a guest on uh, Endakana, which is the homelands of the Western Abenaki and the Abenaki and the Wabanaki, a uh, larger scope of land. Um, also known now as Vermont. I'm in Middlebury, Vermont, uh, as an assistant professor of theater at Middlebury College, which is very cool and very new. I'm a theater maker, um, and I engage in theater as a, a forum by which we share and our humanity and our aspirations, our hearts. I'm so moved by what you just said, Abigail. And our... Um, our our flaws, our, our frailties, and our potentially best selves. And um, I, my focus has been on Latinx theater for a couple of decades now. And I served as artistic director for Milagro, which is a, a Latinx identified theater, focused theater, and uh, cultural center in Portland, Oregon. And from there, I was invited to participate um, on the steering committee, one of the first steering committee of the Latinx Theater Commons, which has brought me here. And in that um, very generous space, which amplified a personal goal to connect beyond the silos that had been happening um, for Latinx theater makers around the country, um, to, to, to rebuild some uh, relationships that had kind of been pulled apart because of larger forces, let's say. There had been programs that had been able to bring us together and they were no longer, and they were disbanded because it felt like those projects were deemed um, unnecessary and, uh, and there was a, 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 a lack of community that needed to be healed and so Part of that was the impetus for the Latinx Theater Commons, which emerged out of an act of generosity, um, which was uh, Karen Zacarias, who was a playwright at the Arena Theater in uh, the American Voices Project, which was, had been, um, <laughs> this is where the HowlRound connection happens, I'll just do a little bit of this, um, had been uh, facilitated, organized by Vijay, by Jamie Galoon, who's been mentioned, by um, David Dowran and P. Carl, um, uh, the, I, the playwright who was offered some funding to do whatever she wanted with the money to, uh, in this residency to develop her work, decided that what she wanted to do was to bring some people together to have a conversation about the state of Latinx theater in the country and where were we and what was happening because we missed each other and we were also feeling the um, uh, very, very presently uh, the ramifications of misrepresentation and of lack of our own presence in the field. And I know many people will share that um, uh, as an impetus for coming together and trying to reframe how we are perceived and how we are um, and how we uh, presence ourselves in the field. And so she used her funding, her discretionary funds, to bring together seven people who had a conversation around where are we taking the pulse, who decided that seven people or eight people were not enough people to even begin to have a conversation about the, the community. And so a larger thing happened and about 
80 so people were brought together and then more people and more people and that's, and it is a movement. It, the LTC is a movement. The Latinx Theater Commons is a movement. Um, within that, we have had multiple, uh, we have uh, moments of uh, echoes of that generosity. We have operated within uh, what we hope is a commons framework thanks to the support, the infrastructural support uh, from HowlRound. Um, we have uh, gone through many iterations. We have gone through what is called passing the baton. Um, meaning that when we can no longer do the work ourselves as an individual, we pass the baton to the next person or to somebody who might pick up that work and continue it forward, knowing that that work has been identified by the group as a whole to, um, to as, a, as a thing that we have decided together that we would like to see done. Um, reflecting upon our own work and our own, um, uh, who's at the, in the room, also reflecting on our own biases that we have had to uh, confront and, uh, and learn about our own uh, anti-indigeneity, anti-blackness within Latinidad and how that manifests in our work and who's in the room. Um, and all of those concerns are back to your original question, mm. which was what do I bring into this room? And that's, those are the concerns and the things and the, uh, um, the, the thoughts that yeah. I carry with me into this amazing table of people with whom I'm, I'm learning so much from already. And can't wait to hear you speak, and can't wait to hear you speak. <laughs> and, uh, and so thank you very much, and uh, Hal Roland and Double Edge for this invitation. Thanks, Olga. Um, Jonathan, would you mind going next, please? Yeah, I'm happy to go next. Um, so uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Jonathan McCory. Uh, I, I, I've been piecemealing what am I supposed to be a answering, and I think it's what, am I, what do I bring into the room? How am I showing up? Who comes with me? Um, uh, I bring into the room a lot of grace, how I got here um, today. Like my driver's license was expired on my birthday. I had to get a new driver's license this morning. I had to, my car had a flat tire 20 minutes to getting here. Someone had to pick me up. So therefore there's grace, right? I bring into this room, I bring, I bring into the room radical grace, transparency and compassion, right? Um, I, bring into, I bring into the space also a known, a known sense of what spirit um, can do if you lean into it with, with, with compassion and with that grace and with that understanding. Um, I bring into the room the notion of my ancestors, right? I have a shirt that says I'm powered by my ancestors. So I bring into the room um, that notion of the 3000, the notion that I'm not a singular, the notion that I'm a tuning fork, listening to their unsung, unknown, un, un, uncompleted sentences, and I'm, I'm the lucky vessel that gets to uh, articulate elements of it, not all of it, but elements of it, to be a, ref be, be a fraction of their light in some, in some form or fashion. Um, I bring into the room um, also uh, being um, a creative doula first, but then also the executive artistic director of the National Black Theater. Um, I bring into the room the legacy and the, and, and the beauty of Dr. Barbara Antier, the founder of National Black Theater. Um, I bring into the room um, my teachers, my mentors, um, uh, mainly the people that pop into my head right in this moment, um, Talvin Wilkes, um, uh, who, who, who I call Yoda, he calls me Luke, and we are, he, like, we're, like we, we do the Star Wars thing, um, and he's like, young Skywalker, uh, how, what are you, how are you gonna, how, how, how are we gonna do this? And I'm like, Yoda, I'm trying to get there. Um, so so I, I, bring, I, I bring into the room an amalgam of, 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 of all of those points of interest, and I also bring into the room a listening to the present moment. Um, and I and and I also I bring to the room that I'm on the advisory uh, the advisory uh, committee for How Round. I bring into the room that I have been doing this thing for a while, a minute. Um, I bring into the room that I have a fierce commitment to um, utilizing Black liberation, which is the theory of change for National Black Theater, but Black liberation plus art plus placemaking for the service of human transformation. Um, I bring all of that into the room, and I bring and I bring a nuanced notion of what blackness looks like that is not that is not predicated or actually bound by the limited scope of its uh, singular definition that we might all hold, but actually is brought into actual beauty by its friction, 
by, by the notion that a sci-fi play, sci play is also as good as a play that's done in EBBO, which is also done as great as a play. But as long as it comes from the vessel of a black body, it, it is a black play. It doesn't matter, and, and as long as that individual owns its position um, as being a, continu a, a part of the continuity of that African tradition, we're good, right? Um, and that challenges me. That challenges me not to sit inside of the, inside of the, the anti-blackness um, that I was conditioned to call normal and ask me to lean into the curiosity of my own friction. Um, because I want to create diamonds. My job, I bring into the room that I want to create diamond experiences, diamond conversations. I want to, I, and if we all think about how diamonds are created, they're created through pressure. They're created through the breaking. They're created through the, the, the they're created through a durational process, not a popcorn process. So I'm actually also here, what I like to say, what I bring into the room is that I'm here for a durational relationship. Um, a relationship that will allow for us to think about not just what do we gather in this moment, but how, do, but how is this a stepping stone on a larger trajectory? Um, I bring into the room that like, I've had a long love dance relationship with Double Edge, right? It's come in many, it's come in many, it's a part of that durational, I bring into the room a long standing relationship with Harold, you know what I mean, as my brother, right? I bring, in, I bring all this into the room to create a space of buoyancy um, so that uh, I can allow for my intimate self to show up, not my performative self to show up. Because um, to be honest, I'm, I'm just all top of dome stuff. I have nothing prepared. I ain't got a sheet of paper. I see everyone right. I'm like, I'm failing school. Like, that's how I feel like. Um, and I'm just like, okay, I'm just gonna, you gotta, gotta trust your ancestors. You gotta trust your wisdom. You gotta trust what's deep down inside. What is birthed, what is birthed is yours, will be yours, and what words need to come out will come out, and then I'll shut up like what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna be quiet. Carlos doesn't have any paper either. Oh yes, so we're ready for school, yes! <laughs> I wanna say, thank you. Um, before I pass it, uh, I just wanna say you referenced Yoda and Luke, and <laughs> when I came to Double Edge 22 years ago, and I wrote a, a thank you card to Stacy, uh, saying that Double Edge is, uh, and was and is, my, my Dagobah system. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens in the Dagobah system? <laughs> Right? Yeah. It's great. What a great name, the Dagobah system. Mm -hmm. It's a system that is actually where you're um, close to the source. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And as we, in the time we have, as we head towards applications and implications, um, I just always want to keep close that there's this conversation that what does it mean to stay close to the source um, as resource? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because this question of artistic becoming relates to, as you said, human becoming. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something about these places, like the Dagobah system is in the swamp, it's in nature, mm -hmm. it's, it's primordial, it is, um, it's in the caves. So thank you for bringing that. Um, we started these introductions <laughs> with Okiteo, and I would like to end with Okiteo with, with, with Rhonda. Harold. Harold, I'm on thank a you. Separate so no, 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 no. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Harold, I mean, I'll keep it Please, really no, no, short. take your time. You're here, please. Harold Stewart, my pronouns are they, he. Um, the job that pays me is the executive director at the Theater Offensive. It fulfills me in a lot of ways. We are queer and trans, uh, people of color theater, um, over 30 years old and just a few years old with this new mission, new identity as a queer trans people of color theater, but always LGBTQ. Um, and uh, Dallas, Texas is where I am. I'm a proud Southern. I, I typically identify, and this is why, why this is not good for me right now, um, because I have to say, I was behaving, and so now I have to identify as a safe, sex positive Southern sissy. Um, just to kind of match y'all's energy. Um, so I bring all of that in the room. Really grateful to be here. I'll be responding um, to the beautiful um, offerings here, or at least trying. So I'm like, generalize, generalize, generalize. That's what I'm over here working on. Thank you, Rhonda, for um, this invitation. And I will, well, should I give it to Rhonda? This is yeah, so hard. It's great. I asked Harold to come here as a responder to help make sense of all of this. He's in residence at Double Edge, and uh, I see it. We walk our dogs together, and I said, the more the merrier. But thank you, of course, you're at the table. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you for bringing up the dogs. <laughs> Um, 
co-founder and co-director of Okateo Cultural Center with Larry. And um, I'm gonna also jump into the first questions that you have, just so that we can keep yeah, things yes. rolling as the last person. Um, so I feel like the work that we're doing through Okateo really is centering our indigeneity, reclaiming that in a space where it has been vacant for hundreds of years. Um, I grew up next door in Plainfield, the next town over. I went to school in this town, elementary school, um, and I was the only Native person here. And I felt, why? Why am I the only person? Um, and I also felt like this land needed to be loved. And who better to love it than the original inhabitants? Why aren't they here? And so this is a lifelong dream for me and coming into a relationship with Double Edge Theater, um, with historic sort of land back agreement that we have. Um, Double Edge has very generously given a space um, asking, what do you need? And I said, we need a space that's not institutional, that's not, um, that is our, our own space where we can just be indigenous, the indigenous people that we are from all different, different cultures. And they graciously gave us that space and also gave us their expertise and their time. And for that, I am immensely grateful because now here we are, um, we've, we're operating on a, several different groundbreaking um, funds grants that allow us to do what we need to do to get our work done for our community, first and foremost. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty new uh, to the terms commoning and uh, social, a solidarity economy. And wrapping my head around it, you know, I talked to Carlos, we, we, right, we, we did it, we did a, we did a thing with Carolyn Woodard and you know, and I'm still having this block. What does this mean? And I realized something like this. Well, this is indigeneity. <laughs> this is, Carlos has been saying, you've been, you're doing this work. And I'm thinking, but, but it's not, what, what is commenting? No, this is indigeneity. This is, these are our principles, our tribal values at its very core. Um, I have, depending on how old the elder is, there's up to 17, sharing, respect for others, cooperation, hard work, respect for nature, spirituality, hunter success, domestic skills, humility, responsibility to your tribe. As Larry said, it's what we can do for others. It's the we, not the I. That is the foundation of our, our values. And so we're doing this work, um, not really understanding that, you know, this is commoning or this is, you know, a solidarity economy. This is, this is our values of tens of thousands of years. And so what I want to try to bring to the table is to understand the decolonization, decolonization process that needs to happen within this um, solidarity economy, within uh, commoning is to understand how you have come to need to do this work, how this work has been done for tens of thousands of years on this continent, and why is it important to all of us to be liberated from this oppression and marginalization, how that is important for all of us to continue forward in that way that's not capitalist, that is looking out for each other and what can we learn from each other without um, taking, but sharing. I think that's it. Thank you, Kuyana. Thank you for bringing us into the conversation <laughs> so beautifully. Um, and for identifying why we're together <laughs> and why the names are necessary and problematic. <laughs> um, we are all, um, Bayo Kumalafe, a Nigerian poet and, and um, philosopher, talks about us all being uh, sort of refugees on the, on the, off the highway of white modernity. <laughs> and that 
possibility is, you, you acknowledge, Larry, is happening, is living, and it's also bubbling up out of fissures and cracks, small places, like here. <laughs> um, I would like to ask pointedly how, how you all, and I'll ask you um, a little bit more concise than the introductions uh, for sake of time, anyone want to jump in about how you understand commoning and the solidarity economy and every, all of the other wonderful um, sort of encampments and uh, philosophies and approaches within your practice and your lived experience? Yep. Um, I was. I just resonated with, with what you were saying, Rhonda, about um, the way in which Double Edge provided space um, without imposing, because that's often the, the negotiation is the imposition of, oh yes, but you must then provide a report or uh, you know how many people showed up or whatever it is that is demanded. And I want to acknowledge the way that HowlRound did the similar thing for the Latinx Theater Commons for the LTC. Um, in that when the first eight people got together in the same room with the, the HowlRound folk, um, there was a sense of like, okay, we're gonna, we're, just, we're gonna help, we'll go get sandwiches. I'm not even exactly sure what happened, but there was a way in which they were holding, the, making the space available without imposing any kind of, you should do this and you should do that and you should do that. Um, and continued that relationship, and that has continued for a long, long, long time, for the 12 years. Um, and, and very, but very, very present at the beginning, particularly before we had a producer, who could now be the person who was kind of the point person. And that started off with Jamie Galoon, who's now the executive director at HowlRound, in that she was a, a model of an allyship that didn't, didn't impose, well, you have to do this and you have to respond to us, and this is what we think you need. Um, which is uh, a function of, in essence, and I hate to use the word allow, but allowed us to self-determine, which I know is part of this work, um, and for us to, the, and modeling that, allowing us to be in conversation with each other freely, um, uh, and coming to it then also as volunteers, completely as volunteers for, again, resonating with what you were saying, for the benefit of, of our community and how it engages to your point, Jonathan, how it engages with the larger community, because what we do is not just for ourselves, it has resonances, um, it has other ramifications that hopefully are transformative and healing um, and, and better for how we engage as human beings. So that's all I wanted to add. That's great, and I feel like it touches on this question, especially those coming from institutional settings about, because these are post or non-institutional behaviors and practices, and I think that can be really hard for people to wrap their minds around, so I appreciate you bringing this in. Larry. Thank you, yeah, I got quite a bit on that. Um, so, <laughs> wow. I get really, um, so yeah, what that means to me is that um, it's not even an application, it's a lived experience, a way of life. Uh, me and my siblings are first generation city, Prior to my generation, my mom and all of them lived in tribal communities, reservations, uh, where all this was practiced daily. Um, and there was nobody else around but them, family, relatives, cousins. Uh, uh, the sharing, all the things that Rhonda mentioned were happening uh, without a forethought. Um, and mostly because white people didn't want them around. They weren't welcome anywhere else. And so this practice was um, part and parcel of who they were. Um, and so it's... And it's really, as Rhonda said, it's kind of funny to hear that. Like, uh, I did a talk recently at uh, the, the Massachusetts um, Conservation Commission, and I reminded them this is a new phenomenon. Uh, late 1800s, they were protecting land, mostly for white people. Uh, and um, so the idea of saying that, you know, you shouldn't pee in water because it's going to be harmful, you shouldn't overuse land. I mean, this is something that we knew for thousands of years, and, you know, they were in Europe and pretty much messing up everything and dying off in great numbers because of that. And so they came here and kind of did the same thing. Uh, so now they're catching up. Oh, wait a minute, we got to stop polluting and we're killing ourselves and the lead and the pain and, and all these toxins. And so, um, and as Rhonda said, it's really important to have that conversation how we got here. Um, you know, everybody's doing land acknowledges. Well, I take that back, not everybody, some. And before folks get too excited about patting themselves on the back, it's a reminder that, you know, we've been forgetting about you. Uh, and, and as an artist for over three decades, I think about, uh, I've seen and been on many um, arts and equity conferences, and most of them forgot about Native people. 
and they're calling themselves and calling themselves doing this great work, but they're still forgetting about indigenous people. And so there's, there's a lot of work um, still to be done with that. And uh, that's why um, I'm so excited about this relationship with Double Edge. And, and as an artist, you know, I've been so used to just going to these institutions, performing and get my little check and walk away. I, I can't uplift my relatives. I can't uplift Native people. And so it's kind of just me, right? The one. And we're about the we. So now, Oki Tail, I'm bringing Indians from everywhere. <laughs> and it's scaring people. We got more brown people at Double Edge than the entire town, right? <laughs> we're loving it. Loving it. Um, and so, um, and uh, I just want to uh, mention Stacey here, what she's uh, personally done for me as a friend and, and as a colleague artist, um, and sh she may become a playwright. <laughs> and so uh, um, I've shared my story of my relatives who were taken from their homes and, um, uh, uh, by the authorities and put on these work farms and you know, when they were moving our, stealing our land. And, and so these are lived memories within my generation. And, um, and, and Stacy talked to me, she said, why don't you write a play about it? I says, I write books, I don't write plays. And, um, but uh, I, I thought about that, and, uh, it, and it's just been, and uh, it was a little difficult at, at, at first, um, because as a writer, you want to show everything, and then I realized I'm showing people with my body and with my actions. Bite the strawberry. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, let's, uh, we'll tell you about that later. Uh, um, so, uh, <laughs> Tune in next week. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Sick on block. Getting to write the play Freedom in Season, which is about my uh, great-great-grandfathers and their experience in the Civil War, uh, uh, sharing that story, how while they're fighting for freedom, they weren't citizens themselves, they weren't free themselves, technically, and while they're doing that, they're getting their children taken, their land usurped, and, um, and that's, that was a story that's probably never going to be told anywhere else uh, until other folks get to see it and get that inspiration. Now, I got to do that here because of uh, Stacy's inspiration and, um, and guidance and helping me shape that and, and bring that story to life. and, and and allow other people to come into that world. It was a painful process for me to do that because uh, I'm a traditional storyteller, not an actor. So when I'm sharing stories, I'm sharing that stories that have been passed down for a long time. So this was me embodying one of my relatives and, and, and taking on that, um, that spirit. Um, and so it's just, thank you for all that because what we're doing now, and again, nothing pleases me more as an artist than to see other brown faces come in here and getting their just due and getting their uh, accolades and their support and the things that they need to happen. And, um, and finally, I'll, I'll say that folks who are out there listening, um, you absolutely have the opportunity to get involved, and I hope you do because, um, and I'll, I'll throw some more numbers at you. When you think about uh, uh, black and brown arts institutions, um, we hear about them failing, and that's because they don't get, people aren't investing in them. Um, uh, we live, as, as Rhonda mentioned, we, we essentially function off grants from the government or the state, and when they dry up, we, we close down because we don't have the support of the community. Um, uh, white art institutions get a, about 75% of their funding from everyday people. They're giving dollars and tens of thousands of dollars, whatever, and black and brown institutions get about 6%. So we're not getting the support. People aren't investing in this in the way they should. Uh, they love to come and see us dance and sing, right? Mm -hmm. so, but they need to show that uh, uh, physically in a way that keeps us um, able to, uh, to be responsible to our artists, which means pay them, uh, not having them come for, come for free, uh, um, as um, I used to be asked to do when I first started many years ago, and I did, because I just wanted to be, I just wanted to show what I had to show and share. And then we really, we need to get paid for this. Stop collecting cans to get gas money to go and do these programs for these people who got millions of dollars sitting around and, and just kind of like, oh, well, the Indians are going to come and they're going to entertain us and, and we'll, we'll be happy and, you know, feel good about ourselves. And, and, so, um, and so, so, yeah, that's where I'm kind of at with that is that let's, let's take that conversation a little deeper and to um, reflect why we have to have it, uh, how we've been really neglectful. Uh, um, from, from doing that, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Larry. In both of those incidences, which is quite power, like, it makes me think about how um, there has to be a reframe or a reteach of how capitalism has been bastardized to have a supremacist lens instead of having an indigenous lens, yeah. that there has to be a, re a reappropriation of language. We sometimes, I think sometimes we give language, we, we rob, we, we call language, we call a thing called capitalism the evil thing, but capitalism is the sharing of goods for, for, for exchange. 
It is actually an honest way of making, we live that way. That like, like even if we, if we think about that from a day-to-day -day practice, an indigenous practice, right? It's only supremacy that actually has robbed, has actually created the conditions for us to now not be able to exchange the concepts together in an authentic way. And so when I think about, when I think about the story of uh, the Latinx commons, when I think about the story of, I think of this moment of how we are reckoning with the notion of how to um, reclaim language, yes. reclaim the action with inside language, and give it space to create a new universe, a new way of operating, which is new muscle, which is going to hurt, right? It means that there's going to be damage along the way. And damage is not the, like, I'm working out right now, like I have a personal trainer, right? I have to tear my muscles in order to actually build my muscles. So how can we ever have a conversation about reclaiming the kind of society that we want? We're not willing to have tears. And we're not willing to have, and then you have to have a salve, right? You have to soak, you have to drink a lot of water, you have to have, put some sun in that, right? You gotta do your do. But you also gotta be willing to take the conversation to a place of vulnerability. And through that intimacy, you get to awaken a new, a new space of being. Like, it makes me, I, I'll, I'll stop with the metaphor because I was gonna go with the caterpillar metaphor, but we can go, we, can, we keep on going. Uh, yes, uh, I'm gonna go to David and then to Olga, just because I know David so much of, what your work is, is thinking about well, language and discourse. I mean, I think absolutely right. But to reclaim it, we need to name it. Mm -hmm. And those of us living within the beast, the refugees of white modernity, uh, need to name this to decolonize ourselves. And I think that this is maybe an across the board political challenge. Uh, and for which Rhonda is absolutely right that indigeneity is commoning that hasn't even had to name it because it was a lived experience. And I think there's a really interesting conversation that should happen between that indigenous experience and what so many people trapped within capitalism or perhaps willingly participating in it need to learn, need to hear. And this goes beyond liberalism or progressivism and the belief that the market state is going to save us because it's not. And I think people are starting to realize, you know, it's been 30 years or more since we've known that climate change was a problem and what has the market state done? So it's gonna be this external process of learning the language of commoning, the lived experience of commoning, the social practices, the ethic, the worldview, as a counterpoint to this progress narrative that we've been fed for centuries. So um, that's where we need to go. Uh, I'm so inspired by this. Um, uh, so let me see if I can gather these thoughts in some kind of coherent way. But. You were talking about the, the definition, let's say, of capitalism. And then you were saying it has been somewhat usurped by supremacy, 100%. The notion that there is reciprocity in practice, right, that is different, that might be theoretically a model for capitalism because it is about exchange. You make bread, I make shoes, you make theater, I make dance, and we share what we bring to the table because we can't do it all alone, right? So what happens, though, is when you have a framing, I think, there, where um, supremacy suddenly start, starts creeping in, and David, you bring this up, the notion of enclosures, where suddenly this parcel of land is mine, as opposed to this area is ours, and we care for it, and it cares for us, and we have a relationship with it that is also reciprocal, and we understand it to be family, right? But rather, when this is mine, and I own it, and I have dominion over it, and I determine what goes on it, and who goes on it, and who does not go on it, and how, oh, how big it gets, wait a minute, that's mine too. You know, that, that idea of greed, which then is antithetical to the thing you brought up earlier, Abigail, about the notion of abundance. That there is enough for all of us if we kind of step back from the greed, which again, powers supremacy. Because if I have all this, I certainly must be better. Mm -hmm. That's Great. all I'll say. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Yeah, so again, thank you um, for all of these uh, thoughts. I mean, a, a few things in response. Um, you know, I do a lot of workshops on solidarity economy, and people ask me, what does this mean? And we say, it means to own and control um, our community, to own and control our workplaces, to own and control our land and our housing, to own and control our finances and investments, and then to own and control our governments, right? So small d democracy, direct democracy. Um, and usually I get 
a few responses. You know, so some people are like, that's impossible. That'll never happen. And I'm like, other people are like, we already do that, right? So I, you know, David Graeber, the, the late anarchist and anthropologist, talked about everyday communism, right? All the different ways that we share, right? And you've seen that we've gotten a big lesson in this the last two years during the pandemic of all kinds of mutual aid, all kinds of ways of people looking out for each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we can think of millions of examples, right? So back when people would smoke, if you asked someone for a cigarette, they wouldn't charge you for it. Um, if I'm, you know, if I'm, if, if Matthew and I are working on something and I say, hand me a wrench, Matthew's not gonna be like, that's a dollar fifty, right? So like we, we live these way, we live, we live these things uh, on a daily basis. And then the other response we often get is people are like, my people have been doing this for centuries. This is nothing new, right? And it's like, absolutely, right? Like in many ways, what we're trying to do is remix indigenous economies, indigenous ways of being for the 21st century, right? Trying to hold on again to that long match, right? So, you know, part of the appeal of someone like Maria Degui for me is there was a big debate, you know, he was writing in the 1920s in Latin America, which was mostly rural, right? Still had large indigenous communities. And you know, many you know, people on the left argued, we need to go through capitalist modernity to get to socialism, right? You're, it's a necessary stage, right? We, can't, we have to travel down that road. Mm -hmm. uh, and the argument that he made was, we don't have to imitate Europeans. Mm -hmm. We have our own indigenous commons, right? So we are, you know, he's writing from Peru. He says, we have the Aiju, which is, you know, family clan or commune. Um, again, it's hard to even translate some of these concepts because they don't have analogs in our own sort of English, you know, capitalist inflected language. Um, and they have the concept of Aini, right? So, which is translated as sort of reciprocity or mutual aid. Some people talk about it as sort of the exchange between humans, non-human nature, and like the larger cosmos, right? So just to give you a sense of like, these are not new ideas, right? So in many ways, all we're trying to do is expand that everyday communism from, you know, kind of uh, mutual aid among neighbors to something much larger, mm -hmm. and which, you know, uh, which means reclaiming these indigenous traditions, right? Reclaiming uh, a, a way of being that existed, you know, here in what we now call the Americas, but in other parts of the world, certainly for a very long time, for much longer than capitalism has been around. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I just want to jump in because that's important. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, I was going to mention earlier after you spoke, um, when I was uh, speaking at the University of Cuenca in, uh, in uh, Ecuador, uh, I had a fascinating time, and uh, I can't recall his name right now, but there's a tribal elder from the Amazon, but he's also an academic, and he knew I was coming, and so he came from the Amazon just to see me, and just an absolutely brilliant, he didn't speak English, he spoke Spanish in his tribal language, so they were interpreting, but I could just feel the, it was just resonating off him, that power and energy, and he was just, he was just an amazing human being, and um, um, I got so much uh, uh, good medicine from him and sharing with him, and, and he talked about some of the things that you're saying about that connection, and he was just so wise, and um, uh, it, it was just a humbling experience that he would come to see me, and um, he gifted me one of the, the conch shells, um, I, so I have that at home now, and, um, and, and, I, and I wanted to add that what you just said is um, uh, part of our Algonquin ceremonies is uh, one of them is very significant, it was this giveaway ceremony. Uh, there are many times of the year we just give things out because uh, it's a healing to give. Um, and, and, it, and it's kind of funny because, and you know, this economy, this capitalism is built on, you know, if I have a lot, then I'm, I'm somebody, right? But indigenous culture is that if you have more than others, it's, it's a shameful thing. It's, you should be embarrassed. It was an embarrassing thing to have more than others. Uh, and so it wasn't even our way of life. If you had so much, everybody would be looking at you like, like, what's up with him? Why does he have all that? What's he going to do with it? You know? Yes, it, it, it was a terrible thing. Um, and um, I was, had one more thing to say. Um, and so it's, um, it was a, a, a true way of life for, for indigenous people to, um, to share that. And I had one more thought, and I'll probably come back to it later, but it slipped my mind. And, That's okay. So. <laughs> it's, com it's calling for me um, this uh, you know, sort of semi-famous book called The Gift, by Lewis Hyde, which, the, what's that great subtitle? The Erotic Economy of, the, the, erotic, life of property. the erotic Life of Property, which, um, you know, speaking to your, your points, especially Rhonda, as, uh, you know, as like a, a white artist finding these ways of understanding the role of art and the, the role of storytelling uh, as dream, as healing, as, um, community becoming, right? And finding these sort of, these white academic, yet exciting and good, um, 
translations <laughs> of indigenous culture and practice as a way of understanding, oh, um, there, there's value, there's reward, and there's a different way of thinking about it. And also to dream and to imagine um, has existed in that gift economy, that the story needed to be, um, needed to be um, acknowledged, the, the, the role. Stacy, you spoke at the beginning about your work in the Ukraine in the early 90s and this project. And you didn't mention it, but the, the name of that project um, was Republic of Dreams. And I want to know if you could just say something about, because I, if I, as I understand it, that Republic of Dreams is not only that project, but is a, a bigger idea that's informative for you in the uh, conceptualizing or the finding and unfolding that which is double edge. And that has to do also with the role of dreams and the imagination in this act of recreating and re remembering our life ways. Yeah, that, that project was called Republic of Dreams. That's a, a title of a short story by Bruno Schultz, who was a Polish-Ukrainian writer. Um, and it was about um, basically um, creating, um, well, his vision was creating a republic in um, a sanatorium and um or which is like a metaphor for creating your own reality and your own system of um operations um wherever you could um find that or live um that you carry that republic with you mm. um and that the your your dreams, your ideas, are, and your communities are um, what creates that republic. Um, and I think um, that's been since the beginning of Double Edge and Inspiration. And I think this has nothing to do with Republic of Dreams, but I do want to say something about what I think is commenting because um, recently um, we've we've come a long way with Okiteo and all of our partnerships in a very unexpected ways. Um, like Okiteo is not a room, um, it's not a building, um, it's a whole hundreds of acres now um, shared with Double Edge. Um, it is um, a lot of residents who are living at Double Edge or in Ashfield now. Um, and there is an exchange and we have to deal with each other. So I think um, that's something. Um, and now like Okiteo, when we first started, just had to deal with Double Edge and Double Edge just had to deal with Okiteo and now we have these other partnerships, and they're also wandering around the land. Um, and so we're all Dogs. dealing with each other. Um, but this um, Okiteo made a um, mission um, in October, November. Um, cold, it was cold. Um, that's a, a dugout of a canoe um, that's burnt and this was for nine days and nights, 24 hours a day, um, led by Andre Strong Bearheart Gaines. He is Okiteo and Double Edge's artist in residence. Um, so um, he made that by a stream that is next to our design house um, because he needed water there, so we, started expanding the reach of Okiteo um, in that way. And then uh, in conjunction with that, he took part of the design building and made a wampum workshop. Um, so he is in there and all of the community comes there and does whatever they do in the wampum workshop. Um, but yes, and then, um, Harold, 
um, decided that he was going to make um, candles or something, and he um, started using the design house too. Um, so Jeremy, who's our design director, um, went in yesterday. She sort of doesn't know what's going on because she's been busy directing a performance and having a baby. Um, so she came in and she's like, hey, what's going on in the design house? Because like the whole house is filled with all of these people that she's never really met before and communities and everybody's working fine. Of course, there's, you know, there's going to be the normal fights about who gets to use the kitchen or whatever it is, um, which I think is also important because yeah. sharing means you have to collaborate and you have to organize and you have to agree and disagree on things and all of that. On the one hand, it is not hard at all, um, just encouraging anybody who has a space um, and has a creative practice and or whatever practice um, to think about sharing um, because the rewards of that are immeasurable. Mm. Um, on the other hand, also take the responsibility of that, um, what sharing means, um, which is not just um, giving up everything. It, it really means a lot of work, and that's the kind of work I feel like we should be doing. So getting back to Republic of Dreams, I feel like the design house is a real example of a Republic of Dreams that was mm -hmm. um, created a total surprise, um, nobody planned that, but it can happen. Those um, shared experiences can happen with honesty and hard work. I, I need to follow up on that because uh, Stacy mentioned something very important. The, um, the Mishun, which is, and it goes to your opening in terms of the fire. Fire is a very sacred being to our people and the Mishun, um, that fire stayed lit that whole nine days, and when somebody passes to the spirit world, we light a fire, and it, that fire stays lit for four days. And around the clock, people are there, keeping it going, rain or shine. And um, recently, one of our elders passed, and you know we had a fire. And um, and and also, incidentally, our one of our artists in residence, Tamantha Sylvester, she is from the Anishinaabe Ojibwe people. Now. Uh, a little history on the Anishinaabe, they're out in the Boreal Forest of uh, Wisconsin, um, Michigan, and uh, Canada area, and um, they were here a thousand years ago. It's documented. And they took the fire with them, a fire. They're, 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 can't, they're sacred fires. And it never went out. They carried it all the way there, and it never went out to this day. And so to have her back here as an as a artist in residence is a very, it's just bringing her home to where her ancestors had been th for thousands of years. And you know, they left because they knew of the prophecy of uh, there was people coming to do us harm, but we stayed because we're crazy and we were defending, <laughs> you know? And uh, so we're, we're, um, we're their uh, relatives that stayed behind as they refer in the language. So um, that fire does have a very um, important meaning in, 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 in so many ways how it just goes for, full circle in what we're talking about here today. Yeah, and there's a, a, c a continuum between the dreaming, the sense of agency to create, autonomously and then the technicalities and practicalities of encounter and sharing that is you know up high into the to this to the earth uh, Olga you, you had yeah uh, um, responding to Stacy and also what Larry was just talking about um, uh, and the invitation to talk about dreams um, first and this is kind of taking a second point earlier but the notion that the commons, part of the commons agreement among those who de decide to be commoners means that we have identified, um, I'm going to call it a resource for lack of a better term, but a, care, a shared interest. Care, care, care wealth. A care wealth. A care wealth. A thing that we've decided, thank you. A care wealth that we've decided we're going to mutually care for. 
and we are responsible for it. So when you talked about the kitchen, just that idea that we also have to negotiate among ourselves as people who care about this kitchen and care to use this kitchen, how we're going to also care for the kitchen, and then the kitchen will care for us. Um, but the, so the earlier thought about the dreams, the notion that your image that you presented, Stacy, earlier was the idea there's all these people walking around this land and all these different communities, and here comes somebody who's been here before and doesn't know who these people are. But there's such a sense of trust, and I had to flash back to the idea of the original folk on this land and new people coming onto this land and the engagement that happens there and, and how different this is model that you have created here with the goodwill and with the, um, with the willingness to share, but also trusting that the people who you're sharing with are not going to abuse the trust, mm -hmm. which I think is the historic yes. tradition that we have this abuse of trust of people who came, the people who were here said, oh, here you are, okay, I see you're starving, you know, whatever, however, whatever the different encounters were, because there were different encounters, that's interesting, that's, but, but there was ultimately an abuse of trust that led to where I think we are now. Um, in terms of now we have to step back and, take, and, and reframe how can we go forward, which I think is part of the decolonization, acknowledging that harmful interaction, um, that abuse, and, and how can we move forward and dismantle the systems that have been created through that, those, that power grab mm -hmm. and greed. Yeah, I'm beautiful, if I may. One beautiful piece that I didn't actually get to, to speak to, it's kind of important, is Stacy said to me, you're really good at getting people together. You should have a community forum educating the community about X, Y, and Z, indigenous issues. And I didn't think I had it in me, but she you know, has this way of <laughs> pushing. <laughs> And so we started the Living Presence of Our History series, which is an educational series. And um, HowlRound records and saves these, uh, this, this incredible essential conversations that we have that is, is really my dream of lifting indigenous issues and bringing them to the forefront, educating on, in a larger community sense so that we're no longer invisible. And for me, that part of our relationship is rebuilding the trust, making sure that there's a safe space, making sure that we're heard, we can say whatever we want to or need to and not feel like we're going to be punished or silenced or disregarded. Um, and that is, um, is part of that rebuilding process and acknowledging decolonization and how important it is in the work that we're doing. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Abigail and Francisco. It's like everything that's supposed to happen is supposed to happen because the whole time you were speaking and Francisco was speaking and Stacy was speaking, all I could think about was the word trust just kept coming back and then Olga said trust and then Mano, you said trust and it's this idea of like trust as a currency and I, I think about um, like sometimes maybe that in or it's, it gets complicated, not bad, complicated when we say the way I'm going to show good faith, or the way that I'm going to ask for trust is to pay you money. But because that's the system we're in, that's the way it has to happen, maybe at the beginning, mm. for some relationships. But that over time, you can, you can build that. And I, I think about, like, I'm, you know, I'm not a good, good person to answer this question, because I said I'm not really a dreamer, but I am a doer. And I, I, uh, when people are like, well, how do you make a commons happen? Um, we might already be doing it, but we have to build the trust. And then I, like what you said, Jonathan, earlier about, like, Sometimes it's going to break. Sometimes the muscles will break. Sometimes the work is just constantly um, breaking the trust and rebuilding the trust and then going back to the old hurts and coming back and saying, listen, that wasn't me, but that was them. And so I need to, you know, kind of work that through. And, I, and, and something with the, with the LTC that we always use, we, we, and we still struggle with it, is this idea of it's not necessarily, it's not I, it's we. It's that it's not them, it's us. And this idea that um, 
maybe if we're in community together, for a moment we have to extend the trust to say it's us so that we can fix the thing together. And, and if it doesn't work, then we have to have another conversation. But even in the, what you were saying about like the, the cigarette, like it doesn't actually take a lot of trust to extend a free cigarette, but that's okay, it's just a tiny bit of trust. Um, like you ask for the wrench, but you trust he'll have it. So how do we, that might actually be the work of bringing the commons into more spaces is like doing whatever we can, using whatever currency we can to, to build more trust. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, there's a lot that comes up. Um, I mean, the question of dreams, I am a dreamer, right? And I think, you know, part of why I've enjoyed working with artists is because you have to be able to imagine something else, right? And so many of us, so many of the ways that these systems of oppression continue is because we assume that this is all there ever was, this is all there ever will be, this is just the way things are. And it's like, no, things are constantly changing and moving uh, if we can only imagine something else, right? And I feel like much of what we discussed today, like Jonathan's wearing a shirt that says, what, powered by my, an by my ancestors, and then Carlos is wearing revolution of the heart. And I feel like, you know, those two together can summarize that, that, the, the entire two-hour conversation, which is we need a revolution of the heart, right, that's powered by our ancestors. Um, and, you know, I, I keep coming back to Mariadegui for that reason. He was accused of being kind of a romantic, you know, he's working with all these artists, um, and he, you know, very much believed in the idea of, of, you know, which he gets from the philosopher George Sorrell, of the revolutionary myth, right? The, these are, every political project is a utopian project. So Sorrell also talked about the myth of progress, which is what liberals try to sell us, right? Things are always just getting better with time. And, you know, conservatives sell us the myth of yesteryear. Things were always better in the past. These are all myths, right? And as, as someone, you know, I think David said it earlier, right? Like, we, you know, as intellectual struggles, I think that, you know, you know, I should be able to make a logical case for why, you know, solidarity economy would be better than what we have now. Uh, and it's like, really, you have to hit people in the heart, right? Like, you need a revolution of the heart. People need to think that things can be different, that we can be different, that we can relate to each other otherwise. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a myth, uh, and hopefully a beautiful one that we can all fight for, right? It's, it's, it, it requires imagination, creativity, dreaming on a collective scale. So thank you for wearing the shirt, Jonathan. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for your shirt. I was gonna uplift, and I probably would love for you to talk about a little bit, if you are so inspired, the etymology of bravery versus courage. Um, uh, uh, or I can speak to what I know about it. Okay, great. So, so no, 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 I, you know, when the experts in the room, you ask, the, you ask, you ask. So, um, what, what, I, what I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to uplift was a couple of things, and everything that we we're talking about, and, and we're talking about the heart, we're talking about trust, we're talking about all these different ways of being. Is that what does it mean to center the feminine way of living versus the masculine way of living? What, like, like not saying, like, like allowing, allowing for the fem energy, the soft energy, the the courageous energy, which is the heart energy, so the brave energy, which is the masculine muscle energy, um, the, muscle, the masculine, muscle, masculine, masculine energy of old, right? When I think, when, when, you, said, when you said, it feels like we're doing, um, our elders might say we're doing it, it's like it's, it's nothing new, but it's like the same old, it's the same thing. If that is the case, then we're, do, we're destined to, re, um, to replicate. If innovation is not a part of it, which I think in many of our generations actually have a conversation, and I think all of you are a part of that generation, I have a conversation with the feminine side of their, of their being, not the masculine side of their being. Like, my, I say my spirit is a she. I'm a he, him, my spirit is a she. I, I acknowledge that when people are listening to me, they're listening to a feminine energy, a vibration that's coming through a masculine body, and that I have the, vehicle, I have the opportunity to be a vessel of nuance because of that, right? And if we all could understand the very space of how our heart is, how our heart can be led from not a place of closure, but a place of openness, then we can, then, then we can start to have this, this kind of radical new world show up, this kind of radical new space of the commons, this kind of trust that it really allows for, like, like just, I mean, you know, just thinking about birth, like birthing itself, right? The trust that it takes for a woman to trust that their body is going to allow for this vessel to come out. And that through that courage, wisdom shows up. Through that courage, ancestors show up. Through that courage, life begins to cry for the first time. And that very essence is a new space of the, the universe wakens, wake, wakes up to, right? And so like, when I think of, when, I, when we start thinking about, and I was gonna say also, when, I, when we also think about this, 
uh, this kind of currency and also this commons, I think about the premise of National Black Theater and Dr. Barbara Antier and how she bought a city block for a community of African descent to have a home that was not tethered to slavery, that was tethered to its understanding that they were crowned royalty and that their royalty and their abundance was found on a continent and what she named as for her was Yoruba, was Nigeria, what that's where she said was her space of being, her space of abundance, right? But she was bringing that technology to the corner of 125th Street and 5th Avenue for intentionality, right? 125th Street, because if you go anywhere around the world, it's black. You think of black people, black culture. You think of 5th Avenue, you think of opulence, you think of New York, you think of sex. So she went by the intersection of the two so that there only could be a space for opulence and blackness to show up and have a conversation with each other. And that intentionality is a shifting of, of possibility, is a shifting of how we see each other, and is a shifting of what becomes the beacon, who we can become, and how we also have to share it. What's so powerful about what Dr. Tier laid inside that soil was not just that it was a space for national black theater to do national black theater work, but we have incubated over 250 nonprofit organizations and black business owners, right? We have given the opportunity for a catalytic launching pad, I like to say an ignition, for us to begin to think of new worlds that, think, that lean into abundance and that say that the, the, the tilling that I have done allows for you now to now go another step further. And so I say all of that to say that if we could lean into the film, if we could allow for the film to guide our, our, the precipice of our language, our actions, and our doing, and we allow for us to abolish the notion that our masculine energy, our masculine self, is the dominant thing that will create progress, we might create conditions and policies and different ways of being to then begin to address the very systemic thing that is our own oppression. We are working from a space of crafting a world for our own oppression because we are, con we are sucked on the teat of, 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 that, of, of that conditioning, like how our parents taught us to love each other, right? There's this beautiful thing, and I'll shut up after this, there's this beautiful thing that Hoffman, um, this is uh, Hoffman Institute, I don't know if people know about it, but it's a, it's a, it's a week-long uh, professional development um, process where um, they seclude you um, on, in a mountain with 40 individuals, no cell phone, no, 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 no medication, no anything. You're just with 40 individuals, you have to eat the food that they make, and you have a, there's a therapist there and stuff like that. The whole purpose and premise of it is that Hoffman believed that love is the highest vibration that this world has ever known, mm -hmm. yet none of us know that vibration because we're taught it from our parents. And their parents are taught by their parents and their parents did that. So we don't have our own relationship with love because of that. It's disrupted from, from birth because of that conditioning. So what would it mean to take all that distraction away and start to have a relationship, relationship with that intimate vibration called love? And if you can unlock that, unleash that, come in relationship with it, what worlds would then start to be created? And so I, I say that as we talk about the heart, and as we talk about being part of our ancestors, it's like this notion, this, notion of, this notion of how do we also retool ourselves to understand that like some of our actions need to be reframed as conditional trauma bonds to a historical narrative that's, deep in, that's steeped inside of our blood and that needs to be rectified, baptized, and reclaimed as that so that we can have a different relationship. What happens when we don't talk about race anymore as a construct? What happens if I don't name myself as black? What happens when I start talking about my culture instead of my race? What happens inside the room? And who do we become then? Who am I if I'm not a black man? but I'm a man connected to, a black, connected to an indigenous, see I came in, like what world becomes, what's the becoming? And that becoming becomes the commons. Just jump in real quick. Um, I'm, uh, a, a thing that that echoes for me, the last statement, but the earlier ones, is the notion that the, even the idea of blackness as an identity or Indianness as an identity is a framing that was meant to Otherize. Not only otherize, but homogenize mm -hmm. or erase the complexity yes. of your identities, yes. of your heritages mm -hmm. that yes. have so much richness, yes. but someone came in and said, oh, those <laughs> are black people and those are Indian people, and then I can just put those people in a box yes. and otherize them then, and also because they are, they are generic. I don't have to deal with them as individuals. I have yeah. just one more little thought, which is, 
absolutely the ancestors, and I want to bring into the room the notion of those to come. That what you're talking about in terms of generating the love and generating the, the integrity of how we walk in the world is not only listening, yes. is not only hearkening and honoring yes. the work and the love and the struggle, et cetera, of the people who came before us, and which is why we're sitting in this room, thank you, my grandmother, and, but those who are coming ahead of us, whether we create them, you know, or they, or they are just the next generations who will learn, who will inherit what we, what, we, what we give today, what we, how we act today. Those boxes are settler colonial constructs. Absolutely. And, Jonathan, your words are intoxicating. Like, my mind is just, like, I... Intoxicated. We're here to take your notes. Like, I'm ready to... <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to yes. throw... Yes. I want to throw one word back at you that hopefully will be like, so as indigenous communities, one of the things, particularly um, Larry's community, that they're doing is rematriation. Yes. yes. Rematriating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it is a process that is happening. Yeah. It is ongoing and it is recognized that that needs to The feminine to happen. energy. Yeah. Um, Gosh, yeah. Uh, sorry, Larry, I'll trust you. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking about time and I'm thinking about that um, at this, holding this table and holding this space with me is how. <laughs> <laughs> trying and, to hold this space. <laughs> <laughs> so trying. And, uh, so I'm it's like, no more thoughts. Uh uh, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so grateful I'm to, to, to feel uh, you next to me. So I want to give you a moment. To, uh, yeah, I would say, you know. I want to start with gratitude, I think, for all that has been shared. And also, you know, acknowledge breath again and invite us to breathe again. So in the spirit that you offered it, um, that, and, and this is a practice taught to me by Jonathan and I are fraternal twins. I'm, I'm on the other side, Rhonda, I'm not that prolific. So if you want a normative, real, regular conversation, come see the darker <laughs> brother. Um, but he keeps us grounded. Um, but in this practice of taking unified breaths, right, to, you know, acknowledge whatever needs to be acknowledged. So I do think your generosity, your wisdom, your spirit, your vulnerability is worthy of a breath. So let's breathe together. So as I've acknowledged multiple times, but not in this way. I really didn't know what I was getting into, just walking the dogs and saying yes. <laughs> I'm glad I did, um, and I want to respond to you know, the beautiful opportunity and responsibility. I also want to acknowledge this will be highly generalized and talked about from my vantage point. So again, it's important to know that I believe that I'm a safe, sex-positive Southern sissy. Um, and even honoring that, I think queering is common. That's what I'm learning. Right, especially in a world like this where the normative approach does not serve us, it actually serves no one. Um, so in all that we do to push against um, the normal that does not serve us, um, in the spirit of the world that we desperately need for ourselves and for those future generations, I offer that it is important for me to come at this as a safe sex positive Southern sissy in the realm of theater where August Wilson, one of our great heroes, said that, you know, the South for black people feels like the cultural ancestral lands um, that we belong to. So when he addressed us, um, or y'all, I went here yet, um, in the 90s. I also think, again, in trying to respond to like, okay, how do you respond to the bounty and the richness that's been here? Oftentimes, brother, a black feminist perspective never fails, right? Because feminists, by theory and practice, is really connected. It considers as many people as it can, as many generations as it can. So I'll approach this from a black feminist perspective by invoking first my mother, Betty Jean Stewart. She would say to me that, Harold, um, you got a lot of book sense, but you ain't got no common sense, mm -hmm. right? Which, if you know my mother, that makes sense for her approach to the conversation for her child, but also she was a mother of eight. Right? 
including this queer, radical child that was questioning and had all of these ideas that were informed by something he was reading as he was becoming a queer scholar. She was the grandmother of 15, and by the time she died, in it became an ancestor, because Betty Jean does not die. Um, in 2014, she was the great-grandmother of five. So for her, she ran her house on the common good, not exceptionalism. My grandmother, my paternal grandmother, lived at the top of our block. She reigned over the whole family um, with a sense of a spirit of abundance and a healthy reserve of faith. So as important as I think about how I'm arriving to this conversation, how I'm responding, those two now ancestors, but black femme spirits um, are important to acknowledge. And it is how I understand, or I think I understand, the comments. Aside from that, we've already acknowledged that I am at the helm of a arts and cultural institution, and as you all have really acknowledged, in a white and Western supremacist society, a country, actually, but in a society where white folks are not the majority, right? And Western thought is not dominant, right? Eurocentric thought is not dominant. In fact, if we think about whiteness or strip it away uh, strip away whiteness, what well, we understand it in Western thought, um, outside, out of capitalism, right, and its uh, capitalist intentions and its spirit of domination, we tend to butt up against this thing called commoning that we are talking about, right? We butt up against it, right? The common will of the people, what do we need, what do we want to do, and how we can do it. I think that is the example, definitely, that I've experienced at Double Edge, being a witness. And I also think it's a testimony of your work in this room. So I'm glad to be in this room with people who are doing that kind of work. Um, and really grateful, right? Hopeful as well. In the conversation, I heard a practice of balance, right? One's cultural rights and responsibility as well as uplifting the functional areas of your respective organizations and cultures. Balancing those, you know, cultural rights and re responsibility, I think it's a delicate dance, often, you know, full of tensions, right? Um, a dance that I believe is not served, I, I believe that is best served with all of the book sense to acknowledge my mother, right? And I think about that as ancient wisdom, I think about it as muscle memory, as Sharon Bridgeforth would say, as well as common sense and sensibility. Abundance, to me, is both a cultural right and a cultural responsibility, in need of balance, book or book sense, and common sense and sensibility. I think art, when I define art as the metaphor, living in the metaphor, living in the complexities of the metaphor and the dream and also the magic of it, is a cultural right and a cultural responsibility in need of balance, <laughs> book, and common sense. Adaptation, to me, is a cultural right. It's a cultural responsibility, and it is best served by balance, book sense, and common sense. Mutual aid, to me, is both a cultural right, and it's definitely a cultural responsibility that demands balance, a sense of ancestral knowledge, book sense, and common sense, self-determination is what I also heard you say. I think of self-determination as both a cultural right and a cultural responsibility. It is worthy of balance. It's worthy of book sense and it's worthy of common sense. Cooperative economics, as I would define it, cooperative power is also a cultural right. It's a cultural responsibility. It is served best when we understand it in the will balance, book sense, ancestral knowledge, history, and common sense. Domination is not a cultural right. It's not a cultural responsibility. It serves none of us or our functions well. This one I'm stuck on, so maybe y'all can help me. <laughs> Teaching a white world indigenous methods of survival is what? Is it? A cultural right? Is it a cultural responsibility? Is there a way to balance it out, right? With common sense and book sense, I'm stuck on it, right? And I think this conversation uplifts some of that. That doesn't necessarily answer it. And I feel like that's the continuation because I do think um, for people, and I think there's a difference between people who happen to be white and white people, right? <laughs> 
I think there are some people, none of us really had a say in how we came out and what happened after that, but there are some people who have bought into it as, you know, a white supremacist society, and there are some other people who actively work against it. So when I talk about white people and white culture, it's different from my Stacey, who's someone who happens to be white, right? So I'm stuck, right? Because Toni Morrison says that the function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. Mm -hmm. Somebody says you have no language, you spend 30 years traveling just to prove I have language, I have music, and all of that. Toni Morrison says none of it is necessary. So when we think about this present moment, when it seems so urgent and it seems so necessary, I have to admit I'm stuck. Because as a person who's never lived in the bounty of joy, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. So when I come to Double Edge and make candles, <laughs> them ain't queer candles, them ain't black candles, them ain't artist candles, it's someone seeking a sense of joy. So again, how do we function as a society? What are these common ways of functioning is the question. Is governance, right, a common thing that we think about, right? It's resource, and I have to say resource, and in honoring my grandmother because she would say as a black woman, I'm a resourceful woman, right? So I think she had the right relationship with resource, but I hear care wealth, is that what I, you know? I think resource or care wealth development and management, right? Is that a function that we're talking about here? Community development and management, you know, and again, I'm thinking about the right relationships with these things, and if they don't serve us, don't use it, but what is it, right? Um, is that a common function that we want to unearth? Communications, right? As a common function, as well as cultural advancement and cultural survival, right? I'm intrigued by indigenous notions, and I don't know the tribe that says, once a thing died, let it die, don't start it again because that doesn't necessarily um, line up with what I believe that my black elders who, you know, we're going to keep Dr. King alive until, you know, he's, he, you know we're going to surface it and surface it. So this notion of cultural survival sometimes means letting some things go, something that I'm still sitting with. In, in honor and acknowledgement that something else will be connected to that, whether we acknowledge it or not, and emerge, right? I think the common desire should be that during the cultural shift that I acknowledge as the harvest. I feel like the harvest is always a cultural shift in our black practice. We think about it um, during Kwanzaa, the festival of the harvest, right? But it's a cultural shift, right? And if we've done our job, right, we've stewarded the culture well, then there are plentiful benefits from our harvest. I will leave you with this. I'm supposed to be a preacher, so if this sounds like a black Southern sermon, this is my way of just, you know, making my grandmother happy, right? Um, so I'll leave you with this. And all of your getting, get the type of femme divinity in your life that reigns over you with mystic faith, and that is exceptional in the commonplace. When we do this, it is nearly impossible for us not to acknowledge that the divine in me sees, honors, respects the divinity in each of you. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Giving Harold the last word today. Um, thank you so much. The fire is still going, so this conversation will keep going uh, in all the ways it needs to and wants to. And I guess it's a good time to leave a party when you're having a good time. <laughs> and uh, perhaps a sign of a, a fertile conversation when you don't want it to stop, which is how I feel right now. So there's a bit of pain <laughs> because I want to know what you're thinking because I know you're thinking and feeling and I, I feel that with all of you um, and with you, virtual people. Um, I want to just... Uh, frame one question to take with us and to put out there, which is with all of this spirit, which I'm so uh, grateful for how much of it is here because the desire was for this to be a conversation in our own spirit <laughs> as much as it is about the how. Um, so maybe this conversation continues. In honor of the how, I would love for us to be thoughtful of how we carry forward that which is afoot the upswells 
of activity around us, the models and structures um, in your work, in our work that's around us and share it on because I feel what is necessary is for those models to be known and those upswells to be felt. Uh, we are fighting, uh, it's not the fight with an institution we are so much after, it's the, the, the making those institutions obsolete through our models. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, I'm gonna close out. Uh, thank you for those that were commenting and asking your questions. Thank you Double Edge Theater for hosting this. Thank you to HowlRound. Um, thanks to each and all of you and however we can keep this, um, this conversation going will be great. And we can keep it going. Everyone else, thanks.